Your Excellency, uh, Governors, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here today to share uh, part of my journey with you. What I'm going to talk about today is really three things. I want to share some personal thoughts with you. Then I want to talk about the banks that I've built and what underpins them, what makes them the same, what makes them different. And then finally, just share a few thoughts on the future uh, as I see it. You will see that uh, one of my hobbies is collecting guitars. And I think it's a useful metaphor for when you listen to me talk. I'm a great collector, but I'm a terrible player. So I wouldn't recommend you invite me to play at your, um, at your office party. I want to share with you four things that I believe in quite passionately, which underpin everything that I've done in the past and, and hopefully will underpin everything that I do going forward. And it starts with this first one. Um, I think the great malaise in banking generally is that banks have lost sight of their customers. I think many banks think that they just exist to make a profit. And I believe passionately that profit should be a byproduct of giving the customer a better product or a better service or a better experience. Now, profit, of course, is important. I'm not suggesting for a moment I'm against profit. If you met my wife, you'd know that I have to be absolutely in favor of profit. But what I would say is that it should be a byproduct of doing something well for the customer. And if you manage your business well, you will make a profit. And profit is essential. The people who put up the risk capital need to be rewarded. The people who work in the business need to be rewarded. You need to maintain increasing levels of, uh, of reserves for, for capital reasons and other things. So profit is important, but it's a byproduct. The second thing is I, I've been fortunate to speak at a number of events around the world to bankers, and there is a perennial theme which goes through all of the events, which is, why can't we get customers to trust us? And it's like, well, if only we could educate these poor fools to understand that we are trustworthy. And indeed, consumer groups say banks are not trusted by the customers. The banks themselves say, we have all this evidence. Of course, customers trust us. You go, how can this be? Who's right? And the answer is both are right, because there are two types of trust. Psychologists tell us there are two types of trust. The first type of trust is um, cognitive, which is about competency. Do I trust you, my bank, to be competent? Do I trust you that if I put my salary in on the last day of the month, it'll still be there on the first day of the month? Yes, I do. Do I trust you that you will pay my standing order or my direct debit? Yes, I do. Do I trust you that if I go to an ATM to take out $200, my card will work? Yes, by and large, I do. So people trust banks to be competent. The second form of trust is called associative, and it's about intention. The basic question is this. Do I trust you, my bank, to have my best interest at heart? And the answer, overwhelmingly, is no, I don't. And I think that's right. I think customers shouldn't trust banks. Customers should have a level of distrust about everything in their life, because it's that level of distrust that prevents them getting ripped off. The third thing is uh, about the responsibility of business. In 1962, Milton Friedman produced his seminal work on capitalism and freedom. And he said, the sole role of business is to make a profit. And I think that's wrong. I think businesses have a social responsibility, and I think banks have an even bigger one. And unfortunately, most banks take this as meaning a, a CSR program. But it's not fundamentally baked into the belief system of the bank. So I think that we have collectively a social responsibility. And the last point, and maybe it's just because I'm getting old, but I'm trying to think of what is my legacy 
question that was asked of His Excellency the Governor earlier. And for me, it is about building something that has value, not just a financial value, but has value and that will last. And, and this, you can't see it very well, is a photograph of me and my family, my, my lovely wife Louise, my two boys uh, and my daughter uh, in Chichen Itza uh, in Mexico. Some of you may recognize the, the, the very famous background. And there's really two points to this. Um, first is, it always rains in Chichen Itza, which is why we are completely soaked to the skin, and my sons are wearing um, what look like bin liners. But the two more serious points are, firstly, they are what I value. It's not about money. It's not about the businesses I create. It's about my family. And I want, when I die, I want my children, and if I'm lucky enough to have them, my grandchildren, to go, my father built something of value, of value to society. And as a useful metaphor, the pyramid in the background is something that's been around for thousands and thousands of years. And I would like to think that the things that I've been involved in building will stand the test of time. And a lot of the decisions we make are about, is this something that we are building that will last? So, uh, as you heard, I've built uh, three different banks on, on two different continents. Um, there are some differences, but there are also some commonalities which run between them, which I want to share with you. And to do this, I've picked up on um, Sal Alwari's, Mr. Alwari's excellent theme of the four eyes for the conference. So, if I start with Metro Bank, um, Metro Bank was launched in 2010. I had the idea for it in 2007. It was an idea of uh, a time when most banking was through branches. It was pre-iPhone, uh, pre-iPad banking. And to use the, the, the three of the four eyes uh, that Mr. Alwari used in his introduction, what makes things different? So the first thing I'd point is around imagination. Banks used to think that customers were a product of transactions, to, the, to Brett's excellent point. They were just account numbers. The real success in relationships was through retailers. And we said, well, why can't we build a bank that treats customers the way retailers treat customers? Which is what we did. The point around innovation was all of the data tell us that what matters to customers is value. But banks seem to think it only means price, that it's the price of your liabilities or your price of your assets. How much do I get on my savings? How much do I pay for my loan? But indeed, all of the research data tell us that what matters to customers is value. And value is an amalgam of a number of things. Price is part of it, but only 17% of people choose their bank because of price. Service is important to people. Convenience is important to people. Transparency is becoming increasingly important to people. Being associated with a business that has a social purpose is becoming important to people. All of these things make up the amalgam of value. And you see the photograph. This is a coin counting machine. Bear in mind this is 10, 12 years ago. We uh, put coin counting machines in every, in every store. And they're free to use. You pour them in, you get a slip of paper, and you get your coins back in notes. Uh, and if you're a kid, you can play a game. You can see this little screen here. Um, you can guess how much your coins come to. And if you guess within 5%, you win a prize. So what kids do is pre-count the coins, put them in, then they win a prize, which I think is great. You know, they're starting to think about uh, financial awareness as they're going forward. These machines cost about $20,000 a piece. We put two in each store. So $40,000 is now 60-odd metro stores, so $2.5 million um, of machines, for which there's absolutely no payback. There's no charge for the machines. It is an investment in the customer service an investment in the customer experience. I guess one of the questions I would ask of you 
is if you went back to your board, or indeed many of you are indeed on the board, you're the chief exec or you're a director or you're a chairman, and someone suggested to you, we want to spend two million, 10 million, $25 million with no return just to improve the customer experience, would you do that? And the final point I want to make about Metrobank is integration. How do you start a bank with one store in London, where we did, where you're taking on all of the big guys, with a view to picking up clients when they've got millions and millions of them? And the answer was we build it store by store. We build it community by community. The, the second uh, story I'd like to say very quickly is about Atom Bank. Um, the imagination was this, and, and Brett alluded to it earlier. People used to call this remote banking. You do remote banking on your phone, it's remote banking. I think having to walk out of here, walk up into town to find a branch is remote banking, or drive to a branch is remote banking. The whole conceit of Atom was we are wherever and whenever you are. And the name came from the fact we never wanted to be more than an atom away from our customers. And the innovation was, how do you compete in a, in a big area like mortgages when our cost of funds were higher than those of our competitors and it's a very competitive pricing market? The answer was we drive down the cost of our running our business, its efficiency using technology. And, and a point that was made, I thought, very well last night, very articulately, was that technology is not stuff, it's now a mindset. And how do you use that to create a more efficient business? And the integration was becoming, again, part of our society, linking with the university in our local time, town, linking with charities in our local town. I also introduced Will I Am as, as a, um, an advisor to the board. He was archetypal of our, of our audience, of our um, millennial audience. And indeed, this is a photo of Will and I, although actually it's two separate photos because I'd been spending a lot of time in the Middle East. I flew into uh, Los Angeles, and because I'd spent a lot of time in this part of the world, I was held in immigration for seven hours. Um, I missed my photo shoot. So they did two separate shots. So we were both weren't present at the same time when that photo was taken. Although looking at it, I'm convinced I was there, but, but I wasn't. One of the challenges, I think, in looking around uh, investment in fintech is what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And the problem we're trying to solve with uh, A6400 was people live their lives on their mobile devices. Why can't they live their financial lives on their mobile devices? And the point of imagination was we can take big data, artificial intelligence, data analytics, to look at your money, because most people don't like looking at money. We can look at your, day, your money every second of every minute of every day so you don't have to. And there happen to be 86,400 seconds in a day. That's where the name came from. The innovation was, again, technology-inspired, which was building a platform that is utterly interoperable. So every part of the platform can be plugged out, plugged in. We use Experian for credit scoring. If somebody better comes along, we take them out and plug somebody else in. And in terms of integration, one of the challenges people have is many, many different accounts. So we're using open banking to pull all of those views into one place. You can't be on top of your money unless you can see it all, and that's one of the things that we're doing. Two more things I'd like to leave you with. What I see, I think Brett made some great predictions about the future. Mine are from a slightly different perspective. To paraphrase Bill Clinton, it's all about the customer, stupid. We should have a relentless focus on our customers all of the time. Point again made very well uh, earlier by our previous speakers is that technology in itself is not the answer. It's a way of thinking about the future. I'm often asked what are the key measurements of success in a business? Is it about balance sheet size? Is it about profitability? Uh, and it, is, it isn't for me. There's only two things that matter. 
really two things I measure in all of the banks that I've been involved with, all be them very different models. And they are customer satisfaction is number one, and customer advocacy is number two. If you have satisfied customers who are recommending you to their friends and their family, all of your other metrics will flow out of that. Satisfied customers are recommending you to a friend. And the final point is about branding. How many of you in the room are building a brand within your business? A few hands up. Not, I think there's probably more of you than are admitting to it. Brands are sustainably differentiated business models. Most people don't have sustainably differentiated business models. What they have are name awareness. They have a model that's the same. Do not confuse name awareness and brand building. Name awareness has a value, but it's not the same as brand building. Uh, and my final point is this. Uh, back to Mr. Alwari's four points. Imagination, integration, innovation, and, and inclusion. For me, there is one that stands out as the most important, and it is imagination. And, and please don't take my word for it. Someone far better equipped to uh, articulate the, the message has said this. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>